In this video, I'm going to show how to clone a project from GitHub to Visual Studio 2019 and then walk through it in the debugger. This is an important skill for numerous reasons. Number one, I believe the debugger is the easiest way to learn a new program or a programming language. And keep in mind, in our careers, we're going to spend most of our time looking at code that we didn't write. And walking through it at our own pace in the debugger is a really good way to do that. Secondly, for my lectures, I post them all on GitHub, all the source code examples that I do. And so if you wish to follow along, you can just go to the repository and clone it. So the project we're going to look at is one I have hosted here on Azure. And this is one where you can submit your favorite keyboard shortcut. And I've just made up some names here, but nonetheless, we could say Duke uh, Foo Keyboard Shortcut Alt Tab Windows change active program and hit submit and you see it adds there and then I can also take a look at a JSON feed and all of the data that's on that form is also available in this JSON feed. You see we can paste it into JSON viewer and have a look at what it is. A simple array and you see here that we have some attributes first name, last name, keyboard shortcut, software, and what do. Just kind of remember that for just a moment. I go back to my GitHub repo, choose code, and then I choose this copy link here. I find this works best for me, even better than the open with Visual Studio option. Now I start up Visual Studio and look at what is screaming at me right when I start up, clone a repository. They make it very straightforward. So I paste, and actually since I already have this on my computer, I'm going to put it in a separate directory and I can choose clone. Notice they have different ways we can browse repositories here as well, both Azure DevOps and GitHub. I choose clone. Once we've cloned the project locally, the Solution Explorer appears on the right and we can start to explore the project. But where do we start? We see several important folders like www.root, which has our CSS, our JavaScript, and other libraries, as well as the icon that appears in our tab. Then we see a pages folder, which we're going to explore in just a moment. And then we see a series of .cs files, which we will explore after the pages folder. So let's start with pages. And we'll notice that many of these CSHTML pages have kind of like children, which we're going to call code behinds. And that ends with a .cs extension. Now, what's the difference? If we look at the CSHTML, we see a little mix of some C Sharp code as well as some HTML and then even more C Sharp and HTML mixed together. If we look at the code behind page, it's pretty much all just C Sharp. So index.cshtml is typically the first page of our site, so this is a good place to start. If we look at the very top, we see that it is pulling in a few pieces of information from other areas. Uh, for example, shortcuts, it's saving this into a local variable and it's getting it from something called view data shortcut list. Just remember that for a little bit. And I realize that depending on your exposure to Visual Studio and C Sharp, some of this might be stuff you've never seen before. But that's even more reason to use the debugger because it lets us explore things at our, at our own pace and get into detail when needed. So nonetheless, we're getting this kind of funny thing here. Just remember the shortcut list at the end. Just remember that part. We're getting this shortcut list. We're saving it into a variable called shortcuts. And then later on in the page, we're looping over that shortcut list. In other words, we're shaking hands with each of the shortcuts and we're outputting some information. So that's the look and feel that the user will see. Now, if we take a look at this form, pay special attention to this form right here. First of all, notice form method equals post. That'll be important in just a moment. Secondly, take a look at each of the different fields that we have here. First name, last name, keyboard, shortcut, software, and what do. Those are also going to be important shortly. Let's take a look at the code behind. And this is where most of our logic is going to live. So the first thing we see is we see a few things like namespace, which is kind of like a namespace is like saying, what state do I live in? If you said you lived in Springfield, that wouldn't be enough to identify where you live because nearly every state has a city called Springfield. But the namespace is like a state. The class is like a city. So within one namespace, the class has to be unique. But 
from one namespace to another, the class name can be duplicated. Nonetheless, we run down here and we take a look at this thing called bind property. Bind property, shortcut, and then get and set. So shortcut is a variable name and it's a variable of type shortcut with a capital S and it, it's exposed via getter and setter methods and it has this bind property annotation. What in the world does all that mean? Well, I'm gonna hold control and then click into shortcut and we're going to see something that looks familiar. First name, last name, keyboard shortcut, software, and what do? We've already seen that two places. We saw it in the JSON viewer when we took a look at our JSON feed and we decomposed it into an object, but we also saw it on this form in the index.cs.html. So the naming conventions are important because what that bind property means is when the form is submitted, I'm going to use naming conventions from this form and I am going to map them to this shortcut object so that will already be populated. Now we scroll down a little bit and we see on get and we also see on post. I'm going to put a breakpoint on each of these simply by clicking on the left side. These are both important methods. On get is typically a read operation because it's one of our HTTP actions and then on post is typically a write operation. So I have those two set and at this point I'm ready to debug. I can go up at the top and look at my configuration. Debug is fine, any CPU, and then I'll simply press IIS Express. This will take just a moment. We'll notice a few things. First of all, Visual Studio lights up orange and Chrome does as well. And you see that it has launched a new browser and careful on this port, it tends to select that port number randomly. So you don't wanna put this in a URL, a hyperlink or anything like that because that port can change. But you notice it's spinning right now, which means that the debugger is waiting for me. So what are we doing here? Huh, okay, well, we're putting something in this thing called view data shortcut list. Have we seen that before? Sure enough, we have. In our CSHTML page, we're accessing that view data shortcut list. So what the get method is doing is saying, here are all of the shortcuts that I have so far. And it's getting that from something called shortcut roster, which we will explore in just a moment. Now, a get operation is normally a read operation. So here we're just saying, here's what we have. We're not actually appending anything to it. And at the moment, we don't have any shortcuts, so it's going to come up empty. Now I wanna continue and see what happens on the browser. So I can choose continue or F5 from the window. Uh, it's really a good idea to learn those keyboard shortcuts. So we go ahead and press F5. And then over here, our window opens up. I want to test out our other endpoint, the post endpoint. So I'm going to say checkers, Jenkins, keyboard shortcuts, uh, control, shift, C, control, shift, V. We'll say Windows Office products. It is the format painter. So it will copy and paste formatting information, but not the text underneath. Nonetheless, I choose submit and we see what happens. Our other breakpoint hits in the on post method. And that's not surprising because remember the form on our CSHTML page is set up to use the post method. So from here, we can walk through this at our own pace one line at a time. We need a couple more keys for that. F10 is step over, that means execute this line, move to the next. F11 is step into, that means if we're on a method call, let's walk into that method call. So I'm going to choose F10, and that takes me to the next line. But we see something else is really handy here. I can mouse over a variable from the previous line, and I can look at it, or I can even edit it. So I might say checkers Jenkins, and I might space that out just like so or I can say Mrs. Checkers Jenkins, like so. I can edit the variable in line, which gives me an opportunity to play some what if analysis on my source code. Now we see my browser is still waiting on us, so I'm going to choose F10 one more time to execute this line, and then F5, remember, is continue. Continue means I'm all done, thank you very much. Please continue running the program or stop at the next breakpoint. So I choose F5, and as soon as I do that, the hourglass goes away and we scroll down and take a look, we have something in our roster. Now with that said, let's look a little more closely at this thing called shortcut roster because it appears that we're accessing that in a couple different places. 
We are adding to it in the post, and that makes sense because post is a write operation. We're reading from it in the get, which again makes sense because that's a read operation. So I take a look at shortcut roster, and I see that this is a static class with static methods. What that means is that we don't have to create an object out of this class if we want to use it. It's handy in our situation because we're able to share this static class and static method across different pages on our application. So you see I can click over to our JSON feed and I see the exact same information as earlier, except I see it in JSON format. So let's take a look at that JSON feed page and see if we recognize anything similar there. That's simply feed.cshtml. And if we take a look at this, we say, wait a minute, that can't be right. There's an H1 tag there. I don't see the H1 tag represented in my JSON feed, and indeed we should not. So let's look a little bit deeper. Let's look at the code behind. The code behind is ridiculously simple. Here's our onGet method, but we notice something that's subtly different between this onGet method and the one that we saw in our index.cshtml. This one in index.cshtml.cs returns a void, which assumes we're going to display some kind of output to the user. But the feed returns a JSON result. And what that says is, instead of returning something that is HTML, we simply want to take whatever object is passed in here, and we want to convert it to JSON, and then we want to show it as pure JSON. And what is that object that's passed in? Well, it's our shortcut roster, all shortcuts, so if I click on it, you see it takes us right back here to shortcut roster, which if you remember, is that static class, and that's what can be shared across different pages in our application. One more thing that we want to consider. Let's go back to that index.chtml. If we take a look at this page, we see we have kind of the overhead stuff where we're getting access to variables from the code behind page. Then we see a div that represents the input fields where a user can type data in, and then we see another div that is outputting the data in a tabular format. So we see this and we see this down here, but we don't see all the other stuff. And where is all that? Let's go back to our solution explorer. And when we go to pages shared layout CSHTML, we see that this represents that grander framework. So this has the HTML section, the head, the style sheets that we've imported, and those style sheets indeed came from www root. Uh, anything else we need, any libraries, anything like that. Then we get into our body section, and we see we have our nav at the top, and then render body, which is the place where it pulls in all of that content. So that's a quick look at how to step through a program in the debugger from GitHub, and also a look at our C-sharp project that we're going to be running locally, and this is a good metaphor for a good project that we could make. We are collecting some proprietary data, we're making that data available, and perhaps in the future we'll be able to combine that with other public or proprietary data. So I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.